test. Okay, so hello everybody. So today uh, I will talk about different analytical cal calculations we can do on complex networks. And my idea for the lecture is as follows. So I divided this um, talk into two parts. In the first part, uh, I will focus on static, uh, static networks. These are the networks uh, for which uh, we don't observe any um, evolution in the network structure during the time evolution of our system. Uh, and in this case, based on the example, and this example is the nonlinear voter model, I will show you how to proceed with different uh, approximations. Uh, and we will focus on mean field approximations and uh, pair approximations. Uh, and uh, I will tell more, uh, more about pair approximations since this approximation is more dedicated to uh, network problems. However, the mean field approximation is uh, commonly used, so it's also good to know how to uh, conduct this approximation. So this is the first part. Uh, and of course, based on this approximation, we will try to analyze uh, phase transitions uh, in this uh, nonlinear uh, voter model. So we will see how to do that. And in the second part, uh, I would like to um, focus on coevolutionary networks. And in these networks, uh, in contrast to static networks, the network uh, structure can also change during the dynamics uh, of our system. Uh, so uh, here, once again, uh, I will explain how to proceed with the kind of calculation based on the uh, example. And in this case, uh, this example is the evolving nonlinear voter model. Uh, and we will see how we can extend uh, per approximation we know from uh, per, pair approximation we know uh, on static networks, how we can extend this approximation uh, to also cover coevolutionary networks. And the second part is uh, based on my recent study, which was done in collaboration with Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, and what is nice with this study is that thanks to this pair approximation, uh, we discovered a new uh, phase in coevolutionary systems. So uh, it's a good example uh, of uh, application of this method. So I hope you will enjoy it. <laughs> uh, okay, so since we know the, um, the plan for today's talk, let me start with the first part. And uh, the first part is dedicated to static networks. So uh, um, first we have to uh, define the problem. So uh, we have an agent-based model and by an agent-based model, I understand that we have a network and this network is populated by uh, agents in such a way that with each uh, node of that network where one agent is associated, our agents have uh, opinions on a specific subject these opinions are represented by variables. And of course, our agents uh, can uh, change their opinions uh, during the time evolution of our system. And uh, these changes are done um, during interactions. Uh, and these interactions occur only through links in that networks. Uh, and the um, question we want to answer is how our uh, model behaves on different networks uh, probably we would like to uh, maybe identify some features of uh, the networks that impact the model behavior the most. Uh, and to answer these questions, we have to analyze such a model on uh, different structures uh, from the uh, point of view of studying social systems. Probably we are mostly interested in complex networks since, since uh, these complex networks may represent um, some social structures. And here we have two uh, real no, uh, two groups that, uh, two groups of networks that uh, represent these, uh, these, these social, social structures as well. And these are um, small world net, uh, small world networks. So these networks are characterized by high clustering coefficient. 
That means that uh, we have many triangles in uh, such a network, or equivalently, it means that uh, in such a network, uh, neighbors of a given node are highly likely to be connected as well. And uh, also, these networks are characterized by short average path length, and th uh, this uh, means that it's relatively easy to go from one node to any other node in the, in the network. So this is the first class. And the second uh, class uh, form scale-free networks. And these are the networks uh, that have power law in the degree distribution. And this means that uh, we can easily found in su such structures hubs. And hubs are nodes with many connections, many um, with high degree uh, of a node. So of course, uh, since we uh, since we analyze uh, models of opinion dynamics, uh, we are mostly interested in these networks, but we will conduct our simulations and approximations also on other structure to compare our results. Okay, so uh, what approximation we can use what, uh, what we are going to cover. So uh, when we consider a really simple graph, uh, graph structure, it's a complete graph. And a complete graph is a graph in which each pair of nodes is connected, as we can see on, uh, on the picture. And then we can use pair approximation as uh, advice is pair approximation, as since in the case of a complete graph, mean field approximation uh, gives us strict uh, solutions. However, a mean field approximation is also uh, used to uh, study the dynamics also uh, on a model on complex networks. Uh, and very often it's used as a first uh, approximation uh, to study the dynamics. Um, but of course, uh, complete graph topology can simulate uh, or mimic uh, only small groups, small societies. And that's why we uh, would like to have some uh, mathematical tools to study complex networks. And here we can distinguish many different approximation. Uh, but here I, uh, I listed two of them, which are quite common. The first one is heterogeneous mean field approximation. It's, uh, it is an enhanced version of mean field approximation. However, in this case, in this case of this, per, uh, in this case of this uh, mean field approximation, um, it's difficult to derive some analytical uh, formulas, uh, and this is mainly because uh, under this uh, approach. We assume that nodes with different uh, degrees um, uh, changes uh, their states, uh, they, their, their states in different ways. So, uh, in fact, uh, when we uh, try to write down the formulas that describe the system, we have as many formulas as uh, the maximum number, maximum degree uh, of uh, a network. So we have many formulas and. Um, basically, we are forced to use um, numerical um, numerical solutions to solve the system, um, and that's why we, uh, in this talk, we will focus on pair approximation. Uh, and uh, this is uh, this is because this pair approximation is easily analytically traceable, and in fact, it's enough to have two or three equations as we will see to describe the system. So basically, we will focus on mean field approximation and pair approximation. OK, so now let me say a few words about uh, the model we are going to consider. So um, for the purposes of this lecture, uh, I will focus on nonlinear voter model as our dynamics, as our example. But of course, there are many models of opinion dynamics uh, that can be used. Uh, to simulate uh, social uh, phenomena, and uh, we oh, we have we have chosen this uh, nonlinear voter model uh, because of two reasons. The first one is that um, this is quite a simple model, so we can obtain analytical formulas under this pair approximation. So we don't have to rely 
on um, a numerical methods or uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So we can compare our analytics with uh, simulations. And the second reason is that um, it's a really a popular model. Uh, and, it, and this model is used not only to study opinion dynamics, but also other um, uh, socioeconomical processes like, for example, uh, diffusion of innovation or group formation, group popularization. So uh, it's good to know how to calculate different things uh, with this model. And uh, although uh, all the examples uh, will be uh, shown based on this nonlinear voter model, uh, the tools I, I show you can be applied also to other models of opinion dynamics with binary opinions. Uh, these formalism, uh, I mean, um, per and infill approximation probably can be also extended to uh, to other uh, to other models with other types of opinions. But we will focus on binary opinions for simplicity. Okay, so let me uh, now define this nonlinear voter model uh, in its uh, original version uh, introduced by Castellano uh, some time ago. So this model uh, represents how the information uh, spreads in the society under the influence of conformity. Uh, and it's an agent-based model uh, that I uh, already uh, said uh, previously. And it's also binary state model. In our, in our case, voters, ha uh, voters have uh, opinion in the form of a variable that can be in two, state, uh, two states, uh, one or minus one. And we will refer to these states as positive and negative opinion for simplicity. Um, and uh, this is how the dynamics works exactly. So let's imagine that we have a network. This is a part of the network comprised of uh, n voters. And in each time, um, time step of our simulation, we choose randomly one uh, one voter from all the voters in the network, then um, uh, from its nearest neighborhood defined by the network topology, we choose randomly Q uh, voters. These Q voters form a, a group of influence that tries to exert social pressure on this initially chosen voter. Uh, and um, this social pressure uh, is, um, is um, like this social pressure is fulfilled when, when this uh, group is a unanimous in opinion. That means that all voters in the group has the same opinion. Uh, and then we yield to, uh, to the social pressure and take the, the, the same uh, opinion as the influence group has. So, conforming interaction occurs. Uh, on the other hand, when uh, the group is divided in opinions, like for example here, not all uh, agents uh, in the influence group has the same opinion, then our initially chosen voter can anyway change its opinion, but this happens only with some probability and this uh, probability is a, a parameter of the model, epsilon. So this, uh, so, uh, this uh, model has two parameters. The first one is the influence group size. This is, uh, of course, an integer because this is the number of members of this uh, influence group. And uh, the second parameter is a noise. Uh, so this is a value from zero to one since this is the probability. Um, probability uh, that a given voter changes his opinion the case of disagreement in the influence group. So this parameter can be regarded as some kind of noise in the system. Okay, so this was um, original formulation of the model. However, there is also equivalent formulation of this model in which we can define our uh, Q-Voter model based on a uh, flipping probability, some function that returns uh, as the probability that a given voter changes its opinion to the opposite. 
um, having, uh, knowing the fraction of disagreeing neighbors they have. And when we look at this formula, then we can realize that in fact, uh, it makes sense not only for uh, values of Q that are integer, but also uh, makes sense for, um, for values of Q that are real and positive. Uh, so in many later modification, uh, this integer, uh, this, uh, this parameter uh, that uh, stands for the influence group size uh, is taken as a real positive number. So um, it depends on the study. Sometimes it's an integer, sometimes it's a real positive number. And uh, also in uh, many of the later modification of the model, this noise, uh, this parameter, the, this level of noise in the system is um, set to zero. So we have even simpler, uh, simpler interaction in, in our system. And in fact, we will study not this original uh, model of Castellano, but, but we will consider more one of modification of this model. Uh, and uh, this modification, uh, and in this modification, we will have not only conforming um, interactions in the, as in the original model, but also uh, we can uh, encounter non-conforming interaction that decreases the order uh, in our system. So um, in fact, we will focus on one uh, model uh, that was introduced by Piotrniczka and Professor Vera. Uh, that includes uh, in the system conforming and independent interactions uh, so that uh, the parameter parameterization of our model looks like this. So uh, we set this external, uh, we set this level of noise to zero. However, we introduce another parameter. This is the level of non-conformity in our case since we uh, consider uh, independence in our system, this would be the level of uh, independence. And uh, this uh, parameter tells us how often in the system we have non-conforming interactions. So to, uh, to uh, illustrate how this um, mod modified uh, nonlinear voter model works, uh, let me show you the diagram. Uh, so in this model has two parameters. Uh, the first one is the influence group size. Uh, and under this formulation of the model, Q is a uh, integer. And the second uh, parameter is the level of independence. So the model works like this. So we choose randomly one, uh, one voter and with probability uh, this uh, voter independently uh, of its neighborhood can change its opinion and uh, it changes with probability um, half. Uh, on the other hand, uh, with, uh, with uh, complementary probability one minus p, uh, it conforms to the uh, group of influence. So first he has to um, gather um, two uh, voters that are neighbors of him. And when this group is unanimous, then it takes uh, the opinion of the group. Otherwise, when the, when the group is divided, then nothing happens. So this is, uh, uh, this is the model we are going to study. But before I, um, we, we proceed with, with mathematical uh, analysis of that model, let me uh, say a few words what we are going to study. So um, basically we want to focus on uh, analyzing different phase transitions. And according to um, Landau's theory of phase transitions, to uh, each phase transition, we can uh, introduce one or more order parameters. In the case of, um, in the, in the case of uh, social systems, uh, such a parameter uh, is, uh, is uh, very commonly taken as a 
public opinion, this is just a, an average opinion in our system. And we will also use uh, um, this um, public opinion as our order parameter. However, we will rescale it to the concentration of positive voters. And we do that uh, because it's more convenient for uh, conducting calculations since this concentration of positive agent has uh, nicer in interpretation because this is the probability that we will find uh, in our system an agent that is positive. Okay, uh, and uh, what we would like to know is, uh, for example, how, the, how this order parameter changes in time, what are the stationary states of this order parameter, so, um, so that we can uh, tell something about phase transitions which are, uh, we can uh, observe in, uh, in uh, such a model. And of course, we will also want to uh, know what is the role of the network structure and the role of the dynamical rules we use uh, in our system. Uh, and so, since we want to study these phase transitions, um, you know, we have to somehow define the phases and this is uh, done based on the order parameter. So um, in our system, uh, uh, in our system, we, we can encounter two phases, ordered phase and uh, disordered phase. Uh, and we distinguish between these phases based on the value of the order parameter. So disordered phase is uh, when there is no majority opinion in the system. So both opinions are equally likely. So we can see this phase here. Uh, and uh, the second phase, the ordered phase, uh, is when we have uh, a majority opinion. So, so one opinion is uh, more likely than the other. So these are, for example, these states. And now, depending on how these uh, order parameter changes, when we change some other external parameters of the model, uh, control parameters, and in our case, this control parameter is uh, this uh, level of independence in the system. And so depending how this order parameter changes with control parameters, whether we have, uh, whether we have a jump in order parameter when we move from one phase to another, or whether we have smooth transition between one phase uh, and the other, we can distinguish between discontinuous phase transitions in which we have this jump and continuous phase transitions uh, in which uh, we do not observe uh, these discontinuity. And discontinuous phase transitions are also characterized uh, by phase coexistence, as we can see here. So for a given value of the uh, control parameters, we can be in uh, um, either in a disordered phase or in the ordered phase. And also uh, these discontinuous phase transition are characterized by um, presence of hysteresis. Uh, so we can distinguish here a hysteresis loop uh, and hysteresis is a property of the system that final, uh, final or stationary states are dependent on the initial state of the system. So uh, we would like to differentiate between this uh, different types of phase transition we can to, we can um, we can observe in our model. So uh, how we can do that? So this is the part when we are going to consider different approximations. So first step is to write down the rate equation. This is a differential equation that um, that gives the time evolution of our um, of our concentration of positive voters. And in this rate equation, we have to know the transition probabilities. And these transition, transition probabilities uh, are basically the probability that uh, uh, our concentration of positive agents increases or decreases by such an elementary value and this uh, elementary value, value corresponds to the situation in our system in which 
single voter changes its opinion, uh, in this case from negative uh, to positive opinion, and here from positive to negative opinion because uh, this concentration decreases. So uh, everything boils down to finding these transition probabilities. Uh, it's also good to mention that, uh, that uh, we call, maybe not often, but we call this uh, the right-hand side of this equation, we call an effective force uh, because uh, this is analogy to um, mechanical systems uh, since this force drives the dynamics, our dynamics. And with, when this force is equal to zero, then we have a steady state. So we can think of uh, the right-hand side of this equation as a, an effective force that drives the system. Okay, so the first approach we are going to consider is to use a uh, new field approximation to derive the, these transition probabilities. And in the, under the new field approximation, we have uh, two uh, basic assumptions, two important assumptions. The first one is that uh, we neglect all the fluctuation in the system uh, in a sense that we assume that our system is homogeneous uh, so that the global concentration that is calculated based on all, uh, all opinions of voters is equal to the local concentration of positive voters that is seen by a single agent. So this is the first uh, assumption, we neglect all fluctuations. And the second assumption is that uh, we treat uh, opinions of our voters as independent. And now based on these two assumptions, we can easily uh, find out this, uh, these transition probabilities based on the um, dynamical rules that govern this model. So, um, let, let, uh, let me derive these, uh, these transition probabilities. So let's look at the transition probability uh, that increases um, this um, value of um, concentration of voters with positive opinions. So in order to, um, so, uh, in order to this value to increase, uh, we have to first choose a voter that is negative in its opinion. And this happens with a global concentration. So this global con concentration uh, is just one minus C. And then uh, in order uh, to make this voter change its opinion to the opposite, then either a conformity uh, have to, uh, has to occur. And this happens with one minus uh, C probability. And then in the case of conformity, we have to govern a unanimous Q panel comprised of Q voters. And since we assume that our local concentration of uh, positive voters is the same as the global one, then uh, in this place, we also use this uh, concentration of positive voters calculated based on the all, uh, whole po all population of uh, our voters raised to the power Q because uh, we have to gather Q, uh, Q um, voters with the same opinions. And of course, we have also the second part uh, that corresponds to independent behavior. And in the case of independence, the probability that we will change our opinion to the opposite is uh, one over two. So this is this the second part. So as we can see, this is quite simple in the case of the mean field. And now, uh, since we know uh, these uh, transition probabilities, we can easily derive stationary states. And these stationary states are just states for which uh, the time evolution of our uh, concentration of positive voter ends. So the effective force is uh, equal to zero. And these stationary states are represented in the phase diagrams on the, on, uh, in this picture. 
Uh, and uh, the next step is to find out which of these states are stable. Uh, and this is done based on standard um, st stability analysis that we know from dynamical assistant theory, probably. And um, so to state whether a, a given uh, stationary state is stable or unstable, we have to uh, calculate uh, such a quantity. Uh, and this quantity is uh, the derivative of our force. Uh, over uh, our um, concentration of positive voters evaluated in this point of stationary state. And then uh, whether the, uh, if this, uh, if this uh, quantity is negative, then we say that the, our stationary state is stable and we can plot it uh, by solid line on the phase diagram, or uh, we can state that given state is unstable when this quantity is positive. And then we uh, plot it in dashed line on the phase diagram. So as we can see for the Q Walter model of independence, depending on the size of the uh, influence group, uh, we have different types of phase transitions. Okay, so th this was, uh, this was uh, analytical approach in the midfield spirit. Uh, it's also uh, good to notice for, for uh, illustrative purposes that next to the uh, effective force, we can introduce effective potential so that uh, this stability analysis can be done based on this effective potential. So uh, when we introduce this effective potential, then the stable states, uh, stable states uh, are in the minima of this potential, uh, whereas unstable states correspond to maxima in this, uh, in this potential. So this approach uh, is equivalent to the, to the first approach from this slide. Uh, okay, so uh, this was done in the mean field spirit, but how we can now extend this uh, mean field approximation to cover more advanced uh, structures. Uh, so this is done in the following way. So in the mean field approximation, we assume that our system is homogeneous, uh, homogeneous and without any fluctuations. So we assume that global concentration is equal to the local concentration of positive agents. However, in the uh, pair approximation, we do not assume this any longer. And then we say that global concentration is, is not the same as the local one. Uh, and this local concentration is in fact approximated by conditional probabilities. So in fact, we condition on the um, first state of initially chosen voters, voter. Uh, so theta up is the probability that uh, that we uh, choose randomly a voter that is down. So by voter that is down, I understand voter with negative opinion among all the voters uh, with positive opinion. Whereas uh, the theta down is uh, the probability that we choose a voter that is positive uh, among all the, all, the all the neighbors of a voter that is down. So basically what we do in the prior approximation, we condition on the uh, initially chosen voter state since we already know this information from this equation. In the mean field uh, approximation, uh, we skipped that information. So we didn't use it and that's why we have uh, lower accuracy uh, as we will see. Okay, but uh, anyway, this is the idea, but now we don't know how we can uh, approximate calculate this conditional probabilities. So the approach is as follows. Uh, so uh, the idea to derive this conditional probabilities, exact forms of these conditional probabilities is to introduce another uh, variable, state variable that describe our system. So now next to this concentration of positive voters, 
uh, which, which is a fraction of uh, voters with positive opinions uh, and concentration of negative voters, which is just a complementary value to concentration of positive voters. We, introduces, uh, we introduce a concentration of active links. And by active link, uh, I understand a link that connects voter with different opinions. Uh, and uh, now based on this concentration of active links and concentration of positive voters, we can figure, figure out uh, what are these conditional probabilities. So the approach is as follows. Uh, so uh, we first have to realize that this concentration of active links uh, can be interpreted as a probability that we choose an active link from all the links in our network. Uh, however, since we uh, consider undirected network, the probability that we uh, first choose a down link and then the, up, uh, the down uh, node or agent with a negative opinion and then its neighbor with a positive opinion is the same as uh, the probability as we first choose uh, uh, an agent that with positive opinion and then we choose its neighbor with negative opinion. So uh, these events are equally likely because we have this uh, undirected network. And uh, then based on the conditional um, probabilities, uh, so this is the definition of conditional probability, uh, we, can, uh, we can find out the forms of our conditional probabilities. Uh, however, uh, we still don't know how to calculate how V changes, how this concentration of uh, active links changes in time. So in order to uh, find out this, we have to write down additional second uh, equation for the time evolution of this variable. Uh, so how we can do that? So first of all, we can uh, uh, figure out what are elementary changes in V. Uh, and by elementary change in V, I understand a change that is made uh, in the system when a single voter changes its opinion to the opposite. So for example, here we have uh, part of the network and uh, this focal uh, voter changes its opinion to the opposite. Mm, and let's assume, assume that initially this uh, voter uh, has um, I active links and its, and its degree is K. So uh, mm, initially we have K minus one inactive links and I active links. And after a flip, we can realize that all inactive links become active and the other way around uh, so that the change uh, in the active links uh, amounts to k minus two times i. And of course, we have to normalize this amount by the total number of edges in our network. And this is just n times the average node degree of the network divided by two because this is uh, undirected network. So um, in this, in such a way, we find out elementary changes in V. Uh, however, we don't know uh, um, how many uh, neighbors our voter has. So we don't know its degree. We don't know exactly how many active links it has. So uh, we have to ha somehow deal with that. And the simplest solution is to average over all uh, quantities we didn't know about we don't know about. Uh, so in fact, we have to, to, to find out the average change in concentration of active things. We have to average uh, over the state of our initially chosen voter. This can be uh, plus and or minus one. Then we average uh, over um, degrees uh, that are possible in our networks. So here comes the network degree distribution uh, that we are going to consider in our study. And uh, finally, we have to uh, average over all, um, all possible values of uh, active links in our network. 
and uh, active links that uh, our chosen voter has. And uh, here uh, we also assume an uh, additional thing, and this assumption is uh, that active links in our system are binomially distributed with probability with these conditional probabilities we derived on the previous slides. Uh, and uh, based on this assumption, uh, we can find out the, the average change in the concentration of active things. What we have to add here is the model dependent probability of opinion change, of a single opinion change, uh, given we know this active link number, uh, the degree of our network, uh, of our uh, voter, um, and uh, the model parameters. Uh, and for the model with, uh, for the Q-voter model with uh, independence, this formula has the following form. So the first part corresponds to conforming interactions, whereas the second part corresponds to um, independent behavior of our model. And uh, delta B is this uh, elementary change in, uh, the, in the system. So here, uh, so here I presented um, the, both um, differential equations for the time evolution for concentration of positive voters and, um, and concentration of active links. And these are the general forms that can be used also to other models of opinion dynamics. What it changed for our models and uh, exchange uh, the, these um, transition probabilities and also this function that returns uh, the probability of a single flip in our system, given all, um, all um, parameters and all the values of, um, of other variables we are going to average. And so what is also, uh, um, maybe good to notice is that this first equation can be um, can be uh, uh, write down in the in the form that is similar to the second one uh, however in this case what is different is also uh, is only this uh, elementary change in the c because we have in this case we have uh, only two possibilities c may increase or decrease by uh, one over n uh, so, uh, thanks to this simple form or, of C, we can uh, do the summation over, uh, over all these uh, indexes and we will get the, the, this form. So, Arek, yes. one question. What is the difference, maybe you will say in a minute, but what is the difference between this F uh, in the C over the T and this C yeah, and this F? This F and which one? And this one in, uh, that defines uh, how C changes in time. So in this uh, red uh, frame, in the red frame, you have DC over DT. This, yes. this, this is exactly the same. Uh, this, I forgot about the index yeah. here, but, but yes, this is And OK, same. so you don't have K inside, in fact. Yeah, you have exactly it. the same. It's just differently it's, written. Yes. <laughs> it completely now I realized. Different. That's why. Yes, it should be the same. Yeah. So that's yeah. I, I I know of course because I saw many papers. That yeah. You, yeah. But I thought that may be confusing for others. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's definitely confusing. But yeah, so sorry for that. This is the same. This is the same function. So uh, here I just wanted to show you that uh, in fact these two equations are have really similar form and only dif dif differs in this uh, part of elementary changes. However, this equation can be, uh, can be sum over all the sums and then we get this, this simpler form. Okay, uh, anyway, uh, so when we uh, put here all these functions for our q voter model, then we arrived at uh, these equations and as we see what is interesting here, uh, although in the initial uh, equations, we had uh, the whole, whole uh, network degree distribution, um, at, 
uh, at the end of the day, we arrive at only uh, average node degrees. So uh, the only feature uh, that is connected with the network structure and goes to the um, equation uh, is this average node degree. So from the pair approximation, uh, we can reason based on this pair approximation, we can reason that only the average node degree should matter and no matter on, how, uh, on which uh, network we simulate it. Uh, so networks with the same average node degree should give the same solutions. Okay, so first uh, let, uh, let me show you how, uh, how accurate are these, uh, these equations by simulating simple trajectories of our system. So here we have, uh, here we have uh, plots that represent uh, trajectory of our system. So how um, this, um, this concentration of positive voters changes in time and your time is, uh, uh, is counted in Monte Carlo steps. And in the uh, upper panel, we see how this, uh, how the, this trajectory looks look like for small systems. Whereas for, um, for bottom row, we see both simulations that are depicted by uh, dots and uh, analytical solution for, from pair approximation that are plot, plotted by uh, solid lines. And what we can state is that for small systems, uh, our, uh, our model uh, or our system fluctuates around stationary values. Uh, we have large fluctuations and these fluctuations can push our system from one to, uh, and to other stationary states, whether they possible. Uh, whereas uh, the, the larger the system, the smaller the fluctuations. And for high enough, uh, for large enough, enough systems, uh, even a single trajectory uh, follows pretty well the analytical solution that we can uh, obtain from the pair approximation. So here we have uh, different, uh, different trajectories from different initial conditions. And we see that uh, the agreement between simulation and the um, uh, analytical approach is uh, high. Okay, so for a large system, the per approximation works, uh, at least here, uh, great. For smaller, uh, for smaller system, we have to average these trajectories many times to get better, uh, better, um, uh, better accuracy. Okay, so uh, now, uh, since we want to analyze phase transition, we want to uh, find out the stationary states and the approach is similar as in the mean two case, but this time so we have two, uh, two uh, rate equations. So both of them have uh, to be uh, zero. And the procedure is from the first, uh, first equation, first rate equation, we can derive the equation for p and uh, put this equation into the second one and after some uh, tricks <laughs> so, uh, after some uh, mm, calculations we can arrive uh, uh, at these formulas for stationary values of b uh, as a function of c and other parameters of the model and what is important here is that um, that we can check the limiting, limiting behavior of this equation. And in the case when we uh, take our um, average node degree of the network uh, to infinity, so when this, uh, this average node degree tends to infinity, we, can, we obtain uh, the mean field result. Uh, whereas when we take uh, for this value of uh, the network size one, then we obtain uh, already no solution uh, for the linear voter model. So this only ensures us uh, additionally that we uh, make this calculation well. Okay, so these are the stationary states. Uh, 
And uh, based uh, on this stationary state, we can also um, we can plot this stationary state in, in the phase space. And we can also plot trajectories of our system in the phase space. And uh, here are the green dots are uh, the trajectory uh, trajectories of our system single. In fact, this is a single trajectory of a system in a phase space, whereas uh, continuous lines and dashed lines are uh, stationary states derived based on the pair approximation. So we see that for small systems, um, uh, our, our system fluctuates around the stationary values uh, predicted by, by the per approximation. And the higher the, the, the larger the system, these, um, this fluctuation becomes smaller and smaller. And in the case of very large system, uh, our um, our system follows the the line of the steady state and ends its dynamics uh, at the stationary point for a given um, values of uh, the control parameter as here. So the accuracy is high here as well. Okay, uh, and uh, finally, we would like to obtain uh, phase diagrams or stability di diagrams. And in order to do that, we have to find out uh, dependencies between uh, C and P and P and P. So our both concentration and our external par parameter, which is the level of independence. And this uh, can be also easily done from the first rate equation for the concentration for the time evolution of the concentration of positive voters, uh, we just uh, equalize this uh, equation to zero, derive, uh, uh, derive um, values of P as a function of C and B. And then since we already derived stationary values of B as a function of C, we can use this formula to get rid of uh, one uh, state variables so that we can uh, get P as a function of C or P as a, a function of B. And then we can uh, invert our diagrams, our, uh, our plots, um, and to obtain the phase diagrams. So the procedure is similar. And what we can uh, find out based on uh, these phase diagrams uh, and analysis of these equations is that um, in the case of uh, the Q voter model and per approximation, the type of phase transition depends uh, similarly as on a complete graph on the influence group size. Uh, and this, uh, so we can obtain continuous phase transition when the group size is less or equal than five. And we can obtain this continuous phase transitions when uh, this uh, value of Q is bigger than five. Uh, and uh, lastly, we can also um, derive based on our equation uh, the phase transition point. So this is the point at which uh, we, uh, we change uh, between phases. So uh, when we look at the phase diagram is the point at which uh, the concentration of positive voters becomes uh, half. Uh, and this is why we can derive it easily when we have this dependency. And this dependency is already uh, derived from these two equations. So it's easy to get this equation. And once again, we see that uh, this um, phase transition point in the limiting case uh, that corresponds to the mean field results uh, gives us the, uh, the um, transition point for a complete graph that was already uh, derived uh, in the previous work. So the general behavior of the um, pair approximation for the Q-Volter model is presented in, in these uh, mm. plots. And so uh, we see that the higher the average node degree, 
uh, the phase diagram shift towards uh, higher values of independence. And in the limited case for, uh, for K uh, that tends to infinity, her approximation becomes mean field approximation. Okay, so this was uh, what we can obtain from analytical approach her approximation, but now we would like to know how accurate are our uh, predictions. So here I present you uh, Monte Carlo simulations. Uh, and as we see, these simulations are done on different networks that have uh, different degree distributions. Uh, and we see that no matter uh, that uh, the most important thing is this average node degree. So no matter what is the distribution of the network, uh, as long as um, the, network have, uh, this, uh, the network has the same average node degree, uh, the network will produce the same results. Uh, maybe for um, scale three networks, we have more discrepancies between the simulations and uh, pair approximations in the um, in the point of phase uh, in the point of the phase transition. Uh, however, when we compare it to the approximation that we can get from mean field. Well, we see that pair approximation is uh, better. Okay, so the, uh, the, these four, these are the simulations uh, for continuous phase transitions, and the same thing we can do for other set of parameters to also check whether we can uh, correctly predict uh, behavior of this continuous phase transition. And, and as we see, this uh, formula is predicts well. Uh, not only the width of hysteresis, but also the uh, the jump in the order parameter. Uh, okay, so uh, from these uh, examples, we could reason that uh, for sure the average node degree uh, matters for for the dynamics of uh, our model and also for the stationary state. However, we can uh, wonder whether the average node degree is the only thing that, uh, that matters, whether there, there, ha there, there, uh, there are other parameters connected with the network that can influence the, the, the behavior of our model. So in order to, uh, to find out whether there are also other hidden variables that impact the model behavior, we simulate our, uh, our model on what's, what's Strogatz networks. And these networks, uh, in the case of these networks, we have uh, uh, some, um, some parameter of the model that changes um, clustering uh, coefficient of the network. This parameter changes also the average path length uh, that is um, exhibited by the network. However, changing this parameter does not change the average node degree of our network. And uh, this means that uh, no matter now what is the value of beta, uh, all, the, all the networks that have the same uh, average node degree uh, should produce the same uh, phase diagrams. So uh, after we uh, simulated this, uh, this uh, Gibraltar model on what Strogatz, uh, what Strogatz networks, we can find out that uh, there is a value of beta uh, above which uh, the pair approximation gives us uh, accurate results. However, when beta is less than a certain value of uh, than a certain value, then we see um, bigger discrepancies between the error approximation and our simulations. And here on the um, graph where um, clustering coefficient and average path lengths are presented, we see that uh, for high cluster networks, this approximation uh, fails more than for the low clustered clustered networks. 
Of course, this is not uh, a strict rule. This should be uh, this should be only uh, an indication that our pair approximation uh, may work better, because, uh, for example, on the on the square lattice. Uh, the average um, clustering coefficient equals to zero, so it's really low. Uh, however, per approximation doesn't uh, work so well. Uh, and on the other hand, on the complete graph, uh, per approximation works great because this is in fact a new field approximation. And on the complete graph, this uh, clustering coefficient is equal to one. So, um, so as I said, this shouldn't be uh, treated as a law. It's more like an indi indication that our uh, calculation may um, describe the model behavior well. So to summarize the first part, uh, we have to uh, remember that uh, we can use uh, that in per approximation, in new field approximation, there are two main assumptions. The first one is that opinions of uh, our voters of our agents are independent. The second assumption is that our system is homogeneous. And uh, although mean field approximation can be uh, applied to any kinds of models, any kinds of network, it gives strict results only on a complete graph. And very often it's the first uh, approach to uh, knowing the model. In the case of per approximation, uh, we uh, doesn't uh, we don't assume any longer that uh, opinions of independent uh, opinions of voters are independent in our system. In fact, uh, we assume that neighboring opinions are dependent on each other. We also assume binomially uh, distribution of active links. And what is uh, important for uh, an average node degree that tends to infinity, we obtain the mean field results, and weak clustering of a network can indicate uh, can indicate that uh, we can apply this per approximation with high accuracy. Alec, can and, I yeah, can I ask sure. one thing? But also, like you uh, you assume that with mean field approximation, you have homogeneous system in a sense that the concentration of this positive voters is the same in the whole system, but within per approximation, you also assume homogeneity in a sense that the concentration of active links is uh, yes. the same in the whole society. Yes, that's, that, that, that's true. But when I when I think that yes, it, this is this is right because you, when... you you then you write that this probability that you this conditional probability that you choose yes, up when right. you have down is the same for the whole system. So which means that, that the probability of active links, yeah, the consideration of active links is the same everywhere. Yes, yeah. yes, that, that, that's right. That's but why I, it doesn't work so well on regular lattices, in fact, or like square lattice. If you think about the, the, the border between two large clusters, for example. Yeah, yeah, because here when I, uh, when I uh, say that the system is homogeneous, I, I mean that local concentration of positive or ne negative voters are different. Yes, and this is, yeah, I mean exactly that this part of the equations are, uh, yeah, this part. Yeah. So I, I just interpret this as a local concentration because this is in fact what a given voter sees around. Transits. So, yeah, in, in such a sense, this is homogeneous system. Uh, okay, so this was this. Was this. Yes, and uh, when it comes to the Q voter model, uh, we can state that um, the main influence of the system has the average node degree. Uh, however, as we've seen, this works only for. Uh, networks that are, are uh, weakly clustered. Mm, the higher, the bigger the average node degree of our network, uh, the, mm, the phase diagram shift towards higher values of independence, so there is a higher uh, transition point. And finally, uh, the group, the influence group size uh, impacts the phase transition time similarly as it uh, 
has uh, at it at, at this has place on the complete graph. So if you want to um, to read more about this approximation, different kinds of approximation, I can refer to these two works because based on these works, I prefer the presentation. So you can easily follow the, the presentation and these works. Uh, and now we can proceed to the second part or we can make a break, I don't know. We have, we have some time. And uh, we have, but we have 20 yeah. minutes or something. So I don't think if, I don't know. Do you need a break? Maybe? I don't think. No, they don't. <laughs> okay. Yes, because uh, we have like next lecture at 5.05. Uh, yeah, so yeah. Very full of lectures. <laughs> okay. So, um, so yeah, so maybe I will uh, go right away to the second part. So in this part, uh, I would like to show you how we can apply this for approximation, uh, slightly modified uh, in the case of co-evolving networks. So uh, to put it into perspective, we have to say that these co-evolutionary co networks, uh, which are also called adaptive, are the networks uh, in which not only uh, we can uh, find the evolution of node state, but also uh, the network structure changes during the network dynamics. And what is important is also uh, a feedback, feedback loop between uh, these two mechanisms that governs the evolution of the node states and the evolution of the network structure so that uh, the node states impact how our structure evolves, whereas uh, the structures influence uh, the, the node states. And because of these feedback loops, we can observe new types of phase transitions, uh, like for example, network fragmentation that we can see on, on the slide. So now, since we want to analyze such a co-evolutionary system, we have to define these two uh, mechanisms. So the first mechanism, as I mentioned, is covered by our nonlinear filter model. So we uh, now should remember this model well. Uh, so I will present only the second, uh, the, the, the second mechanism. So in this work, our idea was to compare two mechanisms of rewiring uh, links in our net network. Uh, so, uh, in fact, the starting point for this, uh, this study was uh, this reference uh, in which the co-evolving um, voter model was studied with rewired the same mechanism. And uh, we wonder what would happen if we replaced this mechanism with another popular mechanism called rewired random mechanism. And we ask uh, the question, will you observe any differences between models that differ only in this rewiring mechanisms? So the co-evolving nonlinear voter model is defined, uh, is defined as follows. So this parameter has uh, two parameters. The first one is this degree of nonlinearity. Uh, and, uh, and this part of the model is uh, taken from this nonlinear filter model on static networks. So the dynamics works like this. So with, um, we choose randomly one node and then with some probability proportional to the local concentration of disagree neighbors raised to the power Q, um, there is a change in the system. And this change in the system is, um, occurs in the following way. So with probability P, which is the second parameter of the model, uh, we use rewired random mechanism. And in the case of uh, rewired random mechanism, we uh, randomly choose one link to disagree neighbor, and we rewire, uh, rewire it randomly to any other node in the network uh, without regard of uh, its state. Uh, on, uh, on the other hand, in the model with rewired the same mechanism, uh, this rewiring occurs only to nodes in the same state. So this is the only difference between 
these two models. Alec, let me clarify one thing. Yeah. So how it goes? It goes that you either change opinion or rewire to random, or you first try to change opinion. If it's not possible, then you, you rewire. So in fact, then if the P is the fixed uh, yes. parameter of the model, or it, no. So, so yes, it's the fixed yes, parameter, yeah. yeah. Yes, fixed, uh, P, S, P, P and Q are fixed okay. parameters. Yeah, okay. Yes. So with this uh, probability, we have this rewind random mechanism, whereas with complementary probability, uh, our initially chosen voter changes his opinion to the opposite. Uh, and um, how we can predict the behavior of uh, this model. So mm, this time the approach is uh, a bit different. So although we consider undirected network, we uh, represent this uh, undirected networks, network in terms of directed links so that we have four variables. But of course, since in fact our network is undirected and we know the total uh, number of links in our network, uh, we don't have to trace all four, uh, four uh, quantities. But these quantities are, uh, are necessary because based on these quantities, we are going to define our state variables. So uh, in the case of co-evolving system, uh, we can uh, identify three state variables. These are the concentration of positive voters. So this is the same concentration we had of static networks. Concentration of active links. This is also the same concentration but uh, the formula is different, but these are the, the same uh, concentration. And uh, also the, uh, in the first part, I uh, denote this concentration by B, now it's rho. So this is the only difference. However, the, the third uh, state variable, we, which we are going uh, to introduce and which is important for convolutionary network, networks is the link magnetization. And this is important not to confuse this link magnetization with node magnetization uh, because node magnetization, so this, this is this uh, average uh, opinion. And in general, this node magnetization is not the same as a link magnetization, especially in the case of co-evolving system. That's why we have to uh, differentiate between these, these magnetizations. And now, um, the analytical approach as, is as follows. So to find out the time evolution. Sorry, uh, sorry, uh, Alex, to interrupt you once more, but I have to, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about this previous slide still. This one? No, the previous one. This one? No, uh, no, even the previous one. Oh yeah, this one. Okay. Because No, the next one, the, this one, yeah, stop. Because I don't see the feedback loop if it's defined like this, because you say that with probability p you rewire to random, and with my one minus p you just uh, change the opinion according to Q voter model. So it's not that if it's not possible to change opinion according to my neighbors, I will rewire. I will, will you rewire independently of what is happening. So where is the, this feedback loop? Uh, because normally, so. normally, normally, well, let, let me say what I mean. Normally, if I have all my neighbors that are identical already, mm -hmm. I, I will al always follow them. So when this when there is consensus on the network, of course, I will not rewire anything. Yes. But with this, I will rewire independently on the state of my neighbors. But but here is also the case when when row and this local concentration is equal to zero, nothing happens. So in this sense, so if all of my neighbors uh, are the same as, as I am, uh -huh. so all the name, so uh, in fact, we don't have any active links uh, connected to this uh, neighbor, then nothing happens in the system. Yes, so in- Yes, I know that in the end, we will obtain the same, of course, but, but I mean that, uh, because this probability p is not dependent on the state of the of the system, I don't see I don't see how we can call it feedback loop. Yeah, I mean the feedback loop is that the state of our nearest neighbor 
viewers, neighbors, um, determine whether we will rewire our link. So now, I, I don't, don't, I, this I don't see because you say that that independently of the state of our neighbors, I will rewire the link with probability p. Yes, I will rewire link, but only if I have, uh, if I had at least one uh, active link. And if I don't have any active links, then I will not rewire. Ah, yes. Okay, so still, still I look at my neighbors. Okay, so yes. I didn't. Yes. Oh, yes. I yes, probably yes, it yes. was obvious for all others, but but for me, yeah, I, I didn't get it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> So, so okay. Um, this, this, uh, okay, so the, the approach is um, similar. So we have to uh, write down the differential equations for uh, our for time evolution for our, for our state variables. Uh, the first uh, rate equation can be uh, derived directly from, uh, from the model definitions, uh, from the model definition as we did it previously. Uh, however, this, uh, the, the, the following rate equation um, have to be uh, derived based on changes in this uh, numbers of directed links. And then we will use uh, the definition of our state variables to find the differential equations. So based on the, on the first rate equation, uh, I will show you how to do this, how to do this in the pair approximation. So in fact, the approach is um, exactly the same up to this, up to this uh, point. So we write differential equations um, for our um, changes in the concentration of positive voters. We have to find the transition probabilities and these transition probabilities can be, uh, can be derived based on the algorithm of our, uh, our model. So uh, we already know how to write it down, but of course we have to somehow um, approximate, approximate this uh, probable, uh, conditional probabilities. And this time uh, we, can, uh, we can directly use these uh, numbers of uh, directed links in order to derive these probabilities, uh, conditional probabilities. So uh, in fact, the conditional probability that I will choose uh, a voter that is down, a neighbor that, that is down in, uh, with his opinion, uh, given that I am up, uh, is approximated by a certain fraction of directed links that we can count in our network. Uh, and similarly can be done uh, for uh, the, the second. Mm probability, conditional probability. Uh, and um, of course, we uh, still assume that active links are binomially distributed in this case. Uh, and, to, uh, and when we use uh, the definition of our state variables, so we can arrive at uh, the formulas for um, direct formulas for the probability of choosing uh, an active links. And we see uh, now clearly that when this uh, link magnetization is not uh, node magnetization, then these probabilities are not the same as in the previous case. Yes, only when this uh, link magnetization is equal to node magnetization, we can approximate, uh, we can use these formulas derived uh, on the set of networks. Okay. So now, uh, since we have these conditional probabilities, we can uh, write down differential equations. And here, once again, uh, we arrived uh, at these equations and we see that the only, um, the only feature that is related to networks and comes to this equation is the average node degree. Additionally, uh, here in the co-evolving system, we can distinguish between the average node degrees uh, that are calculated among voters with positive and negative opinions. But anyway, only the average node degree of the network matches in this case. And uh, in the similar way, we can uh, 
arrived, uh, we can derive the steady states. And based on values of these steady states, we can characterize different phases. Uh, so um, the phases we are going to distinguish, the first phase so we are going to distinguish is the absorbing phase. And in the absorbing phase, the uh, concentration, uh, the concentration of active things in, is equal, equal to zero. So according to the uh, model dynamics, the, the, the system dynamics ends at this point. Uh, and this absorbing phase can be uh, fulfilled by two states. These are either a consensus state or a fragmentation state. Uh, on the other hand, when uh, these um, concentration of positive uh, of uh, active links is uh, greater than zero, we talk about an active phase. And in active phase, uh, our system constantly uh, evolves. And it turns out that this active phase uh, can be uh, divided further into two phases. The first one is a symmetric active phase. And this symmetric active phase is characterized uh, by, uh, by this, that there is a tie in the system. So there is no majority opinion in our network. Both opinions are equally likely. And uh, average node degrees calculated among uh, voters with positive and negative opinions are the same and are equal to the Aboriginal degree of the network. And this, uh, this asymmetric active phase is present uh, in both uh, models, in the model with the rewired to same mechanism and in the model with rewired to random mechanism. Uh, on the other hand, we can also distinguish an asymmetric active phase and in this uh, asymmetric active phase, a majority opinion arises in the system. So uh, one opinion uh, dominates over the other. And we also see that uh, average node degrees calculated uh, among voters with, uh, with different opinions are not the same. And interestingly, this uh, asymmetric active phase is only uh, displayed by the model with the rewired to random mechanism. Uh, and now uh, I would like to show you the whole phase diagrams for both the models so that we can compare, uh, compare these uh, models. So uh, the, first, uh, the first difference, important difference is that in the model with the rewired to same mechanism, uh, only uh, continuous phase transitions are possible between this coexistent uh, symmetric uh, active phase and, um, and absorbing one. Whereas in our model, uh, there is also part of the uh, phase diagram when, where discontinuous phase transitions are possible between these phases. And the second, uh, the second important difference is that in our model or the model with the white random mechanism, also this uh, asymmetric active phase appears, whereas in the model with the right same mechanism, uh, this uh, asymmetric active phase is not observed. So now since this phase diagram is quite complicated, I will divide it into parts and we will see uh, exactly what types of phase transition we have in different um, ranges. So in the first uh, part of the phase diagrams, which ranges from, uh, for which uh, values of uh, Q ranges from zero to some threshold value. And this threshold is given by the average node degree only symmetric active phase is present in the system uh, so that uh, we can witness continuous phase transition from the symmetric active to the absorbing phase. Uh, and this is exactly the case uh, uh, that we deal uh, when we consider a covalent nonlinear voter model with a rewired the same mechanism. Uh, however, when we cross this threshold, 
then the behavior of the model with the rewired random mechanism is different. So, oh, uh, so first of all, uh, when we cross this threshold, uh, then uh, we can observe that asymmetric active phase arises in the system. Initially, this phase is unstable, but later on, uh, this phase becomes stable. And, uh, and the second thing we can observe is that the symmetric active phase loses its stability at some point so that discontinuous phase transitions are also possible between the symmetry active phase and the absorbing one. And here we have the same uh, phase diagram, but from a different angle. And here we see this asymmetric active phase clearly because uh, these uh, are the solution for which uh, C is not equal to half. So this is the asymmetry active phase. Uh, and uh, in this part of the phase diagrams, we can also uh, introduce another threshold. And this time, this threshold is independent of the average node degree of the network, as we can see. And between these two values of uh, Qs, we can observe these continuous phase transitions. They may occur directly between both uh, active phases or between the symmetric active phase and the absorbing one. And finally, when we cross this second threshold, uh, then we deal with two continuous phase transition. Uh, transition, the first one occurs in the uh, active phase and at the points uh, at the point of spontaneous symmetry breaking, uh, the majority opinion arises in the system. And then the second uh, continuous phase transition occurs between this asymmetric active phase and the absorbing one. So uh, this is the whole picture, how our model behaves. And uh, now we can, uh, now we can. Well, like on, on, I wanted only to tell you that we are running out of time. So yes, yes, but this is the, the only slide. So the most okay. important, yes, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the, the here we wanted to uh, uh, to identify this asymmetric active phase also based on Monte Carlo simulations. These are not the standard phase diagrams. These are heat maps that represent the average time spent by the system in a given point of this diagram. And um, I just uh, want to draw your attention that this asymmetric active phase uh, predicted by uh, our analytical pair approximation is also uh, visible in the simulations. So um, at least uh, our um, pair approximation uh, predicts the appearance of this asymmetric active phase, although is not so accurate in the case of co-evolving networks. So this is just a short summary of the second part. So the most important uh, thing is that thanks to this pair approximation in which we also introduced this uh, link magnetization, uh, we discovered a new phase, this asymmetric active phase, uh, uh, and uh, the discovery of which would be not possible if we uh, weren't considered this pair approximation. So um, that's all I wanted to share with you. Thank you for your attention. If you uh, are interested in um, this study, you can also check it on archive or uh, check the article. And if you have any questions, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Perfect timing, like just precisely <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 90 minutes. So do you have any questions? Maybe, maybe I will now stop.